G'day guys, welcome to G-Man Speaks. Today, we're gonna talk through a subscriber story that has been sent in by one of my regular viewers. He wanted me to share this story to show and warn men of some of the female predatory behavior out there and how anyone can get caught up in a bad situation. So without further ado, guys, let's jump in. It's a bit of a longer one, so grab a drink, uh, but I definitely think it's worth listening to. Hey, G-Man. Here's my whole terrible story. Forgive me if it's a bit long and detailed, but I sometimes make my living as a scriptwriter, so it's hard not to wax on a bit. Hey, mate, makes both of us. I love a good yarn. Okay, cut to as we say in the business about three years ago. In between writing jobs, I do some security work, some undercover LPO, which is undercover loss prevention, and a bit of CPP stuff, which is close personal protection. I'm an Aussie by birth, but married a Brit, and I'm ex-British army vet who served in two conflicts, Northern Ireland and the Serbian debacle. I also taught martial arts. I'm no dope either. I am well-read, well-traveled and educated. I say this not to big note myself, but quite the opposite, to show that no man, no matter how tough or smart he thinks he is, is immune from the sort of female predators that haunt the social media platforms. I had no defenses simply because I had no idea people like this woman existed. I'd had two previous long-term relationships with good women, one a Brit and the other a South African. I had never really liked Aussie women, I found them crass, over-opinionated, and too masculine. Wanting to be like the boys, a bit too much for my liking. Hey, mate, that makes uh, two of us, and I'm sure a lot of the men at home agree with that sort of preference. So, being in my 50s and single, I was getting it from both sides. My security buddies and my bike club buddies kept hassling me to try online dating. I was happy in myself, fit and healthy, no drinking or drugging, but there was that old desire for warmth and companionship. Never having done the online thing, one of the boys set up a profile for me on a site called Plenty of Fish. Oh, mate, Plenty of Fish. That's the bottom of the bottom. Unfortunately, uh, that mate needs to be sacked. <laughs> I got some hits and didn't really reply because I found the medium to be a bit false and off-putting. However, I did have a date with one woman, 40s sat at dinner, stuffing her face, and talking ad nauseum about herself. Then she got in my car and pounced on me. I kid you not. The whole thing turned me off and I ghosted her. So I pretty much forgot about plenty of fish until, let's call her Andrea, I was contacted by an attractive woman calling herself the Tattooed Vegan Witch, which, at the time, I thought was really just a joke or a spoof name. She had a couple of pictures up and she appeared pretty active and attractive. A couple of tasteful nudes that I found out later one of her work colleagues took, a guy of course. <laughs> Here's the thing, I have tattoos. With guys, it used to be a fraternity thing, military service, bike clubs, etc. But I'd never liked tattoos on a woman as I suspected it to be a walking advertisement for their narcissism. I also now know it's a sign of a lack of morality. Go to any prawn site, go to the extreme category, and you will see that these deviant females all have lots of tattoos. And the vegan thing should have been a red flag too. I met many, but never a sane, decent one. I saw the whole I love animals thing, thing as both virtue signaling and a sort of smoke screen to stop you seeing what terrible people some of them really are. The witch thing, I assumed, was Andrea having a bit of fun with the whole dating thing. How wrong I was. So I clicked the like button, or whatever it was, and sent her a brief message to say hello. With my phone number, and within minutes, my phone rang. And from that moment, something changed inside of me. I wish I could find the words to describe it, but at the time, I thought it was just an instant, profound attraction. But there was more to it. As dramatic as this sounds, I felt like I lost control of something very fundamental. I'd been in love before, and I knew that this was different. There was desire, but it was sort of desire I had no power to resist. Later on, I found out just how she did this. 
Anyway, from that moment, we were inseparable. She lived in Byron, of course, and I was in Sydney, but we were on the phone all day and all night. One conversation went on for 12 hours. I kid you not, my neighbor complained. Wow, mate, that is a marathon conversation, man. I guess some of you dudes love love talking to chicks on the phone. I'm a five-minute guy, personally. She was selling up in Byron. Found out later just how annoying she was up there. And that's a place where every weirdo and flake in Australia gravitates to. Her mother had recently died and left her a huge house in Sydney. So she was coming down. And in her beautiful words, she said she wanted a guy when she got there. (laughs) Andrea hated being alone. Later, I found out why. She had recently, a week or so previously, broken up with a guy she picked up at a car show. She liked his car, she told me. Did some research on the dude, and he was a real hillbilly bogan. But cars were her thing. She had a 70s classic car. Let's call it a 73 Monaro. It wasn't, but she's too easily identified by the real thing, so I won't name it. She spent thousands putting in a big V8, etc. into it. It was a real attention seeker. Picture it. Attractive woman. Masses of curly hair. Heavily tattooed. Always dressed provocatively, driving a blood red hot rod. I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there who think this is all a big plus, but for me, I could see it was just a way for her to attract attention of males. Like a bag of sweets kitty fiddlers carry around. (laughs) All the signs, all the alarm bells, all the negatives, and yet I still met up with her when she hit the city. And it went exactly the same as the phone calls. Instant attraction and straight into bed. And the witch thing, that was real. When I walked into her bedroom, the first thing I saw was a round table and about three feet in diameter, sectioned off into segments and an occult sign in each one. A dagger was jammed into the center of the table. When I questioned her about it, she was vague. Something I later knew was always a cover for her lies. She had been a part of a coven in Byron, but didn't do it anymore. However, as I got to know her, she slipped up by telling me stories of guys she had hexed over the years. Always dudes who have escaped her web. Pretty scary stuff, dude. Now, I also know now that witch burning wasn't simply the persecution of innocent women. It was a way the community protected itself from these times. The creation of social media is a godsend for them, a hunting ground for a unique form of female predator. When I told her she was my first internet relationship, she replied that all her relationships had come from the web, and they were legion, believe me. Andrea had inherited a huge house in the inner city, an old Federation classic with many millions. Her mother had died surrounded by junk and totally alone and had been mad as a hatter. The woman was, according to Andrea, as evil as it came, had prostituted her out at 13 and allowed other men to um, use her up for action. Yet it didn't stop her moving into the house, the supposed torture chamber and taking the millions her evil mother left her, all of which had led me to doubt her stories. With Andrea, she lied so much, and at such depth, you never knew what was true. So me, the tough and smart guy who thought I was, moved into her house to help her get it sorted, which involved turning it into a fortress. The emphasis was always on security. The house itself was stuffed with valuables. Her crazy mother had hidden away cash, jewelry, and gold coins. And I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth. She had bought a safe, but was still paranoid about it. So I made up some PVC pipes for her to bury in the garden. Then told her not to tell me where. Not because I didn't trust myself, I hate thieves, but because I did not trust one of the many ex-lovers turning up. Less person knows, the less they can tell others. But here's the real kicker. For all her wealth, Angia was tight as a crab's asshole. She had been renting out her house in Byron to a young couple trying to get a start. But when she found out they had moved a friend in, she wanted more rent and threatened eviction. Imagine having all that wealth but still be prepared to make a young couple homeless for a few extra bucks. I should have seen it then, but I was too stupid. I was just working working stiff. 
I was just a working stiff, but I paid for everything. The expensive vegan restaurants, bought her diamond rings, pendants, Apple Watch, big TV, and loads of other stuff. She never put her hand into her purse once, except one day she bought me a motorbike, expensive and beautiful. At the time, it blew me away, but now I know why she did it, and it's been repaid. It was a loan she made clear, not a gift. Gifts were not her thing. In her mind, any man of being... Any, in her mind, any man who had the privilege of being with someone so sexy and beautiful had to pay for it. And speaking of action, you think any woman that advertised herself so openly as a sex goddess would be phenomenal in bed, right? But strangely, it was just the opposite. She was selfish to the extreme and somewhat warped. I should have seen the signs. In one of our long phone calls, she asked me what I like to do sexually. And I said, I like loads foreplay, something most women would want to hear. Her reply was, that scares the shit out of me. Why didn't I see it? Andrea's idea of foreplay was her appearing naked and expecting you to magically get a boner and take her to bed. In two years, guess how many times I got oral? None. Zip. Zilch. The whole look at me at the sex queen was an act. It was just pretense, posturing. She had no understanding of what a guy needs, but simply demanded that she be given orgasms on a daily basis. I kid you not, I was living on Viagra and Cialis, and it was affecting my health as much as the vegan diet I had agreed to maintain, and the Jamisons I was guzzling just to keep sane. Jesus. Truthfully, I feel a deep sense of shame writing this. Up to meeting Andrea, I was pretty good at defending my position and expressing my needs. But I had no idea what I was up against. Years before, in the UK, I had become interested in certain spiritual movements, and I visited a meeting run by a well-known Sufi teacher, Irene Tweedy. I remember her saying that evil wasn't a force harnessed by a Satan or the devil, but simply the human ego that existed in all of us. My wants, my desires, my needs. This is the force that is really behind all evil acts like abuse. My needs must be met and are more important than your suffering, etc. And in that sense, Andrea was a truly evil being. Her need to dominate and manipulate and gaslight her victims was hard and wired into her DNA. But in fairness, like most people who go down this path, she paid a big price for it. She is a tortured soul herself. As I got to know her and explored the madness, the sheer craziness that she carried with her could not stay hidden for long. She had been diagnosed with BPD, something that made her totally unstable emotionally. She would rant and rave and curse and threaten me, and I would follow her around the house with a bong, begging her to use it. Weed was a lifesaver. By that I mean my life. One puff and five minutes later, she would come up to me warm and loving and say, I'm so sorry, I got so crazy. True, there were good times. We have a lot of fun together. We laughed a lot. We would dance and just act like big kids a lot of the time. And to be fair, she did try sometimes to be normal and loving. She went out of her way to comfort me at times when the army stuff came up. which just added to my confusion. But the sheer instability of her moods always had me waiting for the inev inevitable, emotionable disaster. She was also a self-harmer. When we did fight, when I finally spat the dummy and told her a bunch of home truths or exposed her lies, she locked herself in the bathroom, heated up a wide coat hanger and put five burn welts on her wrist, perfectly spaced and even like a Qing symbol, permanent scars that reminded her, she said, of how mean I was to her. Go figure. Oh, wow, mate. This is a real piece of work. Female predators have a sort of radar that lets them home in on men who will take a fair bit of abuse. As I'd had a pretty dysfunctional childhood, something she identified in our long conversations, which I now realise was her fishing for anything she could use to manipulate me, she also knew I had a big rescuing complex and would go to the wall trying to save her from herself. And I also put myself at risk doing it. One night after a mega fight, she locked herself in the bathroom. Fearing she was going to harm, I broke the door open. I put my hand on her shoulder and she swung around and punched me in the eye, hard. I told her the punch. Two days later, I was at the ophthalmologist with a partly displaced retina. 
I kid you not. Why didn't I hit her back? That would have been alien to a man like me. I'd have been fed the blue pill from a young age. Never hit a woman. I no longer feel that way, however. She got rid of that bit of idiotic bit of chivalry. I don't know about that, ma'am. But um, I'll just, just leave. Get out. You hit a woman, you're going to be um, going down with the law, whether it's warranted or not. She never slept either. Every time I woke, she was awake. It was like living with a vampire. Interestingly, the last tattoo she got was a huge back piece of a gothic horror scene. Stunted trees, bats, ugly and bleak and very telling. As soon as the sun came up, she would sit bolt upright in bed, strew off the sheets and put them in the wash every single day. Why do people with unclean minds have an obsession with cleanliness? Then it was walk time. Every morning, a two kilometre fast walk that I mostly joined her on. It was like she was constantly exercising demons. Then yoga, then one activity after another. Busy, busy, busy. No time to think or reflect. Just activity for the sake of it. When I would go to work, she would always have an upsetting story for me when I returned. Like how two young guys who delivered the sofa flirted with her. Or the guy at the tyre shop where she took her car propositioned her. On and on. And it got worse. On a daily basis. At the time, I was seeing a counsellor through the veterans program, Open Arms. Very lovely woman therapist who helped me with my army stuff. But when I told her about Andrea and what she was doing, she begged me to get away from her. She even spoke to one of the many shrinks that Andrea had seen over the years, just so knew just how much danger I was in. She begged me to break it off. And did I listen? No, I didn't. One of my old bike club buddies saw the changes in me and did a bit of research on Andrea and her rep. He begged me to get away from her. Once again, I didn't listen. No, stupidity was running the show. Conversing with Andrea, especially when she was stoned, always revealed secrets, most of them terrible and disgusting. She had worked in a massage parlour. Her body count, by what she had told me, must have easily been in three figures. Example, we went for a bit of a honeymoon trip to a beautiful location over the sea to do a bit of whale watching. As we were getting intimate, her phone rang. Some guy left a message saying he was heading up to Byron and wanted to see her. She told me he was just a friend. I asked if she screwed him. Just the once was her reply. So action was okay, but as long as it was only once. She would also have conversations with her buddy that's tattooist. Just a friend, of course. She had lots of male friends, including her male ex-husband. But this friend who had tattooed her naked, that's a real friend. One where the text messages always had an I love you in it. I got one of my club mates to ID the guy and found out he was a scumbag. Golden rule of the bike clubs, never disrespect another brother's relationship. I'm still pondering how to return the favour. And it's not as if I can hold my head up with pride and integrity. She told me a story about a guy up north who had done something terrible to her and being her eternal protector and white knight, I made a call to someone and had the guy slapped. Something I am utterly disgusted at myself for. And worse, I am sure she lied about this supposed sins against her. I was so stupid, so gaslighted. It's breathtaking to think about. The truth was, there was no truth. She lied about every single thing. My therapist said to test her by asking her to swap phones. Andrea could read all my texts, and I could read hers. When I suggested it, I have never seen a person so scared. She went white with fear. Two years of this, and it was having a devastating effect on my physical and mental health. I was drinking heavily, living on Viagra. It got to the point where I could not stand to touch her. The body doesn't lie right. The body keeps the score. So she suggested we see a relationship therapist. Don't they all? We did two sessions and it all stopped. The counsellor, a woman, very bright and fair, told her that she should never have told me about the massage parlour, all the disgusting details of her previous relationships, orgies with her ex-husband, and said that she needed to totally change if she wanted me in her life. That was not what Andrea had hoped to hear. What she expected was the shrink to say that I should love her despite her appallingly sluzzer past. But the shrink made her a cannibal, and that was that. Jesus, that's rare. Finally, 
finally, I actually did manage to get away. And my takeout from this stellar relationship? A drinking problem. Serious health issues caused by the vegan diet. A permanent damage, a permanently damaged retina, and guess what? An STD she had picked up from the hillbilly car bogan she'd been with before me. Pretty good, eh? I'd call that a win. Truth is, it's taken me another two years to write about her, to face this nightmare. Why? The shame of falling into her web so easily. The shame of not listening to the advice of professionals and friends. The shame of being so easily manipulated. But I want this to be as cathartic, as well as stop blaming myself for taking so long to see what was happening. So how did I, how did I get away? Grace. I was sitting on my bike, waiting to go into a sea to see a Cairo for a neck issue that has suddenly reappeared in my life after 10 years for some strange reason. I had forgotten something and asked Andrea to meet me. She drove up in the red 70s, look at me, hot rod, and something inside of me suddenly woke up. It was like stepping out of a dream. She saw it in my eyes and said it was a look of hatred. It wasn't hatred. It was simply a realisation of what I was looking at. Not the desirable goddess, but a truly wicked and deeply damaged person who would eventually kill me either by her hand or my own. I simply did not go back to her house or answer her calls. When I finally had enough distance to take a call, I had a deep feeling of sadness for her actually. I could tell she had been through exactly this many times. There was, I feel, a moment of introspection. But then again, they could have been more acting. I think sociopaths can do that. Incidentally, a few months later, she turned up at my place out of the blue with a bootload of my stuff. Not the diamonds and other valuable stuff, of course, but just junk. As we parted, I made the mistake of kissing her and instantly I felt drawn in again. Part of me disappeared and the desire to be with her came back. I can only think she had been back on the table with the dagger. She used to cut my hair and once she said she kept it in case I F with her. Oh, Jesus. Thankfully, she decided to play games and I rang my buddy who had warned me against her. And like an AA sponsor, he put me back on the straight path. Sounds like a good mate. Last thing I heard, she had hooked up with a group in inner city, of inner city lesbians who she had decided were her soulmates. Knowing the stats of the mental health problems in the lesbian community, I fear the worst. For them and for her. Either that or she's just stayed topping her body count of a different guy every month or so. Either way, she's out there leaving a lot of damage in her wake. So why now? Why all this fessing up? Well, it's simply my way of trying to give back to warn younger guys of the risks of internet dating. It's a hunting ground for the very first women, for the very worst women and it's empowered them like nothing else in history. And it's cathartic for me too, I hope. So listen up. You dumb male fucks. <laughs> and I'm a veteran of the fight. Here's the cold hard truth. Those narcissistic women you see on TikTok and dating sites are waiting for you like spiders at the center of a web. It's not called the web for nothing, guys. And you will not want to hear this, but you have no defenses against them. You were playing on their turf. This arena is an emotional battleground and men are at a big disadvantage. Having said that, there will be some good ones maybe even decent and moral and loyal. They are as rare as the older generation of really screwed up women like Andrea have set the bar and the younger generation of women have drunk the Kool-Aid she gave them. And these childless, bitter crones are now running the show in education, politics, you name it, especially the media. Look at Ali Langdon, who does Karen Affair. Remember how she treated people who did not want to take the vax? As wicked as it gets. Now it's almost entertaining watching her pretend to be a normal human being. Me, I would say I'm as alpha as it gets. I'm smart too, sure, but what you have just read heard is the confessions of a man who reached levels of gullibility, credulousness and downright stupidity that I thought I never had. Yet, out of all of it, I have learned something about myself. Sure, I learned the hard way, but I learned that for all my faults, I'm at heart a decent person. A good but flawed man whose desire for love and warmth were used against him by a very well practiced predator. But that's how bad people work. Kindness is weakness, especially to a witch, a real one. And she even had a cat. Yep, one of those ugly evil flat face creatures. 
When we went away, she said she had to get a cat sitter and get photos of the cat hourly. Her fear of separation from it was bizarre. I'm not making this up. And the irony here is that being childless, when Andrea, when Andrea dies, all those millions that she has will go to a cat charity. It's why she, that's why cats love witches. <laughs> Guys, be smart. Don't be me. There is a war on men, and the only way you can win it is not to engage on their terms. There is a war. There are great women out there. Some have saved my life. Some are my heroes. But they are not on a dating site. Read The Manipulated Man by es- Esla Villa. Brilliant woman. Get armed. If I'd read that book before I went on dating site or read Janice Flamingo, I would have been recognized exactly what Andrea was and steered well clear, probably. But the force is strong. All I can hope is that what I have documented here helps someone, particularly young men. In, in the future, I'm sure our era will be euphemistically called the age of the witch. Stay strong and informed and know the power that you have as men, no matter how much you are told you don't. All right, guys, now that's the end of the story. Now, thank you very much, mate. That is uh, very much a memoir and a confession. Uh, and guys, thank you for watching all the way through to the end. As I say, guys, women are predators and they hunt men. I say it in a lot of my videos. And a lot of guys think they're doing the hunting. But the reality is you're not. Not all of them are like this. This is a very extreme case. But women are hunting for a man to provide a provision for them, to add to their lives, to add security to their lives. There's always something in it for them, whether they're doing it subconsciously or not. So just be aware of that, especially you guys dating in your 30s, 40s, and 50s who are having women love bombing you, um, coming on hot and heavy. There's a reason for it, that you're a mark. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.